Hey everybody, how's it going? It is Alexander Williamson here with the secret history living inside your aquarium. Hold on, let me flip this phone over. There we go. Uh, much better. How are you guys doing, Water Wizard, Brett Della? Uh, welcome. Welcome, welcome. So, today what I want to talk about... What I want to talk about, you and fishes... Uh, today what I would like to talk about is the history of the local fish store, the pet store, um, and basically the hobby in general. Now I have a video that you can go watch that's got some slides in it, and it's, uh, I think the first part's 45 minutes or an hour long, and the second part's maybe mm, half hour long or something. Sorry, I got chocolate on my mouth, I was just being a pig and eating chocolate. So... Uh, as we wait for people to trickle in a little bit, basically, uh, I'll say this one time now, and I'll probably say it a couple more times, but what I'm looking for is I need help from you guys. I need help to gather photos, and if you have video, that would even be better, like links to that stuff. Um, you can get a hold of me on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram whatever's easiest for you guys or email my email is listed on my websites um but basically i need to get more stuff to show while i am talking about this subject i have found a, quite a bit of information some of it conflicting uh with itself uh is in the sources like old sources um Cicero, for instance, uh, talking about the Roman era and the first fish. Uh, Chloe, uh, welcome, and thanks for tuning in for the first time. Chubby Guppy, what's up? Christine Kaiser, what is up? Uh, <clears throat> oh, 12 inches of snow in Woodenville. Yeah, we've probably got, I don't know, eight or nine out here in Seattle in the spots where it hasn't been touched at all, uh, but a lot of it's getting... Uh, you know, melted. Uh, shrimpandplants.com. Welcome, buddy. How's it going? I hope that you are not too snowed in. Chloe, about a foot in Olympia. So we got some local folks tuning in. Good to see. Good to see. So basically, what I'm asking of you guys is some help finding photos because they're just not listed well. And I know that there's books that people have and older material Oh, thank you very much, Michael Keith. Michael Keith, a uh, $5 super chat. You are always an inspiration here. This is my small donation for your dedic uh, for your dedication to your fans. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm thinking about using the money uh, to go to Aquashella or um, the Aquatic Experience, uh, one being in New Jersey in... October and the other being in Dallas at the end of March. <clears throat> the The one in March would be a stretch, but I would really love to go. And uh, depending on you know uh, live stream stuff and Patreon stuff, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a possibility. Also need to talk to uh, a couple affiliates in the plant business and also aquatic arts who may be having a booth there, and maybe I could hop on that uh, train with them and get get going out there. So, what was I talking about? I was talking about goldfish, uh, the first fish kept by people. The first fish, it seems like, were pretty utilitarian. So, there were a lot of... Uh, uh, okay, I have a question really quick. Um, have you gone to the Greater Seattle Air, the GSAS uh, Association meetings? If so, were they enjoyable? Yes. Uh, great, great meetings, usually really good talks, uh, like guest speakers. And then um, the auction is the best part in my mind. You've got the resource of a bunch of uh, people who know stuff about fish some more than others, some uh, have specialties and things. Almost everyone in our club is freshwater, which suits me fine, but uh, if you need salt water, uh, we're not the best club for that. 
and cichlids, we don't have a ton of cichlid like specialists. We do have people who keep cichlids, but uh, yeah. Um, so, but I would recommend if you live in the area, you know, if you're within a couple hours, check it out. <laughs> Ironically, I think that our uh, I've been talking with the board members uh, and the most recent. Sorry if I say uh, a lot today. I'm I'm uh, a bit tired. Uh, uh. So uh, the most recent talk that I've seen is that our meeting for tomorrow is probably not happening. We have someone flying in, or they were supposed to the last couple days, I believe, and they've canceled more than half of SeaTac flights just in general. They've canceled like 200 and then another 200, and I think it's like over 500 flights canceled today. So I don't think our speaker's even going to get into town. He's not in town yet. So, uh, yeah, if you guys don't know what's up, uh, it, Seattle area, uh, the Northwest in general is just getting hammered by snow. Uh, right now it's snowing pretty hard in Seattle again. Uh, S, uh, Brownsman, what's up? A guy I met on Black Friday at the wet, sh wet spot in Portland. Well, I'm glad that you have found my content. And, uh, I'm glad that great minds think alike and we were both there. I actually, you don't need to look at my mug anymore, guys. How about looking at some plants that I got on Black Friday? So these were bulbs on Black Friday, and they have done great. This one was a bulb, and it literally, those leaves are three feet tall in this tank. Like if I unfurl them, they come all the way up out of the tank a ways. So kind of cool. Uh, the crinum, the onion plant, the eaten, all doing well. Uh, and those were all, I think, $3 grab bags, something like that. Some of the boost has been growing out pretty well. I've got a boost of philandra that is uh, Achilles Golden, and that is going to be blooming. It's one of my favorite. You get this kind of blue uh, look on the leaves, blue shimmer, and then silver and gold metallic flakes, and some of the leaves come out gold. I'm excited to see what color it blooms. It's probably white like most of them, but... Could be different colors. We shall see. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Ginger. That's sweet of you. By the way, I still have not heard from the the runner-up from the contest. Uh, so I can say it with almost certainty that you will be receiving uh, probably like 50 bucks uh, towards, towards stuff. Uh Hey, from Portland, uh, Dominic, welcome. So, what was I talking about before? You know what? I'll just keep showing you guys fish while I chat. Uh, and I was going to tell you, um, I was going to just tell you about, uh, let's sit back and let me regale you with the tale of the history of some fish keeping. So, we've got the ancient Romans basically keeping fish for utilitarian reasons. They're keeping mullet, sardines. They're keeping saltwater fish. They recently just uncovered a wreck off the coast of Italy, a shipwreck, where they found uh, ships that had big uh, ceramic-lined or um, grease-lined with wood uh, holes f with pumps that could be rotated by hand. And that was designed to keep sea fish alive by keeping them oxygenated and keeping fresh water in there. Um, you know, temperature was a tricky thing early on, all the way back to Roman times, Samaria, like we're talking Egyptians too. So Egyptians are even older than that. Egyptians and Sumerians appear to be keeping a species of fish that is now extinct that was worshipped by them as a holy fish, also eaten during certain uh, Zoroastrian religious things, uh, festivals and things, uh, or events, I should say. I don't know enough about that. This, the sources are Roman historians that write about that, so that's always a little questionable, but there are people who have corroborated that in Assyria and other places that, yes, rich people had these so-called uh, garden ponds, 
And they started off that just a lot of people in a neighborhood or in a like a in the cities frequently in the Fertile Crescent Mesopotamia, they would build a large three to four story uh, like adobe clay or wood and brick combination house, and they would put a courtyard in the center. And in the courtyard, they'd have a garden. And uh, if they were well-to-do, the family, you know, there'd be a family of 20 people or maybe a couple families living in all the different rooms in these buildings. And uh, they would have a courtyard and keep some of their food fish. Now, the really rich people, um, merchants, kings, queens, you know, royal people, uh, priests also, anybody with scribes, people in the upper class, also uh, had estates and, you know, shrines and temples and things. And so in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, there's definitely uh, talk of ponds and things. So that's keeping fish. But I want to do an episode on the first fish stores, the local fish stores in, you know, the United States, in Europe, and so forth. So jump forward uh, from that, we know that they were keeping fish. They were local fish, but it's impressive to me that they were keeping saltwater fish. So from there we jump forward, uh, let's jump to Roman times. Roman times, they were keeping uh, other fish also in ceramic bowls. Uh, They were keeping mullet and just kind of like funky, interesting local fish, uh, catfish and things like that the low-maintenance fish that could maybe come to the air and gulp or that they could just change out their water frequently or put them in a pond and they could overwinter, um, you know, and then they'd look for pretty versions of that fish. So, you know, bass or perch or sunfish, things like that um, would have been the kind, you know, I'm not saying that exactly those fish, but that's the sort of thing that they would have kept in their little garden ponds during the Roman era, and same thing, middle class kept it for food and just because it was nice to look at until it was time for food, and then the upper class actually started breeding uh, specifically beautiful, you know, silver scaled, uh, like catfish and things like that. So we still don't have a ton of information on that. We have even less on the Middle Ages, but we do know that they were keeping things like the Wells catfish in ponds and that they were keeping uh, small minnows and things like that in ceramic bowls in houses of of very rich people. Um, And so that lays the groundwork for the elite to, you know, pass on stories about these fish. Flash forward, it's really not until the great age of expansionism going on that we have uh, the next set of, of innovations and changes in the hobby, and that is that universities begin to pop up. Before, universities were usually in the West tied to the church. In the East, they're also tied to either a dynasty or maybe um, a religious... Uh, you know, monastery, whether it's Buddhist monks or, um, you know, uh, imams in the Middle East later on, uh, things like that. So you kind of had like monasteries and religious places being the, uh, the place to study things. Out of the Middle East, that's where like distillation happened. And, uh, you know, we learned to make alcohol, which is kind of ironic that, you know, a bunch of religious dudes did that and then promptly uh, banned alcohol in their religion in Islam. So just kind of interesting that the the churches, everything from the Catholic Church, rich people, and the dukes and countesses, you know, counts, of Europe, they did have their own ponds and things. But really what changes is when the Enlightenment starts kicking off, the Renaissance has happened. In the Renaissance, uh, Italy, you're seeing gardens that have shallow viewing areas and even glass ornamentation or maybe like a little window into the pond where you can see the lilies and frogs and newts and things like that. 
a lot of rich folks or just traders that had done well, not traitors, but traders uh, that had done well, uh, basically wanted to uh, become scientists. And back then, uh, you didn't really need credentials other than just doing it. And, uh, you know, then the Linnaeus came along with his system of naming things in Latin and uh, worldwide. As well as, uh, you know, you've got, so you've got Carl Linnaeus, you've got a lot of the first naturalists, and this is going on 1600s, 1700s, and by 1611, the first report of a goldfish or a decorative carp uh, entering Europe is on the books, and they brought back 22 goldfish uh, from a northern province in China. Also, uh, in 1603, koi, which are different than goldfish, by the way, a lot of people think they're the same fish species. They're not. They're different. They may have evolved from a very similar wild species, but they are different. So they then find them... And it's unclear. The Japanese say no, no way. Uh, that the did the Portuguese introduce uh, goldfish to Japan? Some European texts say, yep. When they found the goldfish over there in their their first explorations in the 1600s, they also brought it to from the mainland China to Japan, and then Japan very quickly within a hundred years began to breed them prolifically and just refine it. You know, as Japan does, they get a hold of something and they dissect it to its base components and then from there, you know, really work out how to uh, simplify it or bring it down to its color core and then from there rebuild it up more and more complex. So that's when you start seeing, uh, you know, specific strains and traits in the goldfish whereas before in China <clears throat> it was the uh, Song Dynasty and they believed somewhere around it could have been before them even but somewhere around 900 950 somewhere in there uh, the royal fountains and gardens seemed to have been stocked with carp which were usually eaten but they were stocked with carp that happened to have silver or gold scales on them. Now, they began to selectively breed them for that gold color. Not the orange goldfish that we think of today, but actual golden or like a copper color in out of these silvery, kind of grayish silver uh, carp. And so over time, they start breeding that color and... Rich people who weren't in the royal families wanted to copy something like it. And so they were not allowed to because of the laws on the books, which basically said commoners could not could not have these goldfish. And these goldfish were then, uh, I guess, selectively bred for orange and black and white and all these different colors that started coming out and long tail and fancy tail and meanwhile uh, some people argue that this is when Japan also got them as well probably coming across from the Korean Peninsula hard to say there's a lot of social dynamics going on there even to this day about not getting along between Japan and China and South Korea slash North Korea in general, so it's hard to know what is the truth, what is trying to be nationalist pride, because we just don't have the source documents from anybody except the Europeans, and there they had European conquest and colonialism and all sorts of other stuff going on. So, um, also hard to know for sure if that's truthful. By the way, do you like this purple... Um, this new sword. I got this from Han Aquatics, and he's got uh, he's got a link. I think it's in the description here about. I think it's called like the Secret or something like that. Uh, but you can get. I think it's the Secret Fifteen, all lowercase, and you can get fifteen percent off your order. 
But yeah, a lot of these plants in this tank right now, which was getting ready to be shown, like this uh, Pearl Rotala and this Cabamba Furcata, which I really love that stuff. Uh, and then this Purple Knight Sword that I really hope takes off because Han sent that to me as a little sample, basically. And then some boosts. This is a uh, skeleton uh, boost. You can see all the ribs in it, uh, which is kind of cool. And then Anubius Pinto variegated, uh, whatever you want to, uh, whatever you want to call it. This, by the way, for those of you asking, uh, Fancy Tail Aquatics, welcome, S. Br uh, Brownson. Uh, this is a, this is kind of my DIY rimless, but it is, uh, it is a 17.5 gallon, uh, and then I don't have, like, nice lily pipes or anything, it's just got a big old filter on the back and all that, so, um, but it does have CO2 that I run through it like this with a, a paintball size canister and then a cheapo flu vol setup. I actually just started uh, telling two different people this week about my my uh, setup, which should cost under a hundred bucks, under 150 for sure. And that's if you want like one of the huge tanks, the 20 pound tanks like I have downstairs that are bigger than scuba gear. Um, basically, uh, I've kind of, I don't want to say perfected, but I've come up with a package that works pretty well. So uh, I'll probably be posting links to that equipment, maybe do an affiliate link thing where, you know, you get it for the same price as you normally would, but then I get a little bit of credit. I can put that money towards uh, the channel. So um, from there, let's get back to the story. Uh, but thank you for inquiring and asking. Uh, there's also about 60 fish in this little tank. It holds on to a lot of life in here. And there's 15 varieties of boosts all living on there. And like at first, I was having a hard time with boosts. I, I think it's pretty, but I couldn't identify it very well until I started learning like where you start. So you start with whether it's, you can see the ridges in the plant and what color the leaves are and then what color the stem is. Does the stem have like just red like that and pink or is it white or is it tan or uh, do you see blue sparkles are there stripes on the leaf so all of this plays into the species and uh, astronomical prices uh, basically but I'm trying to get that collection going bigger and bigger and for now they're doing really well um, yeah, so then let's hop back to this other tank real quick. We'll also uh, take a look outside for a moment. So I thought the snow was completely over, but I, it's coming down again, I guess. It, I think it's going to turn to like full-on rain soon. But Scottish Aquatics, what is up, buddy? I hope you're doing well, Scott. Uh, so the next thing that happens, those goldfish that those... Crazy Asians in their crazy science uh, ahead of the Western world again. Uh, oh, you're stuck at work. I'm sorry, Scott. Uh, working outside in this at, at the metal uh, steel plant. That's rough, dude. Mm. Before I forget, I want to show you. I don't know if this is a giant mess up or what, but this has been. This was this size, so like not even a kidney bean for months. Now, all of a sudden, it looks like kombucha. Like, do I have kombucha growing in my tank? Will this create CO2 for my tank? It's definitely some crazy, uh, either bacterial, that would be insane, or I'm guessing fungal complex the way it's growing. Uh, I don't know what it is. If somebody else smarter than I does know what that is, I'd love to hear the answer. I'm a little scared to, like, bug it. Like, fish have gone by it and even pecked at it and seem okay, but I'm a little worried to, like, actually, like, scrape it off and let it float all over the tank, and then I have, like, a billion of those things growing all over. I don't know. I want to figure out what it is, but I, I just don't know, and I can't find an answer by looking it up. and I've never had that happen I've had like other things that on the grow on the bottom and stuff like that but that not not like that 
with such a clear petri dish looking uh, development. So, also this anubi or this boost over here is about to flower. If as I mentioned earlier, so when we were looking at those other boosts, this is Achilles Gold, and uh, yeah. So I should also like in here. There's a lot of boosts, and there's some anubius, bunch of different plants. I should be splitting all these really soon. I could split them now, but I just think they look nice, so I haven't bugged them. So, um, but yeah. So back to the the goldfish. Um, let's see, Christine, what did you ask? Did I miss something? Um, do 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 do. Oh. Yeah, everyone's just saying, oh, it's kind of neat looking. I don't know what that is. I've never seen it before. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the heck it is. I hope to figure that out soon through forums and so forth. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Some of my uh, my rainbow endlers have started to grow without stripes. Like, they're just solid yellow with, like, this cool metallic. Because they these ones bred with a pingu uh, pastel-colored fish. And they, they just don't have any of the black spots and stripes hardly, but they've still got the blue and, like, this really metallic shine. So this is the tank where I put all my experimental uh, fish. When I get a female gold or a, a female guppy of a different type, I'll throw her in here. There's one of every kind in here. And this is just my mismatch endler and guppy tank. You can see I've got wild class endlers in here too. Don't worry, I have a whole stock of them elsewhere. But back to the goldfish and the koi. So the goldfish and the koi coming in uh, 1611. Portuguese are like, all right, let's bring these back to uh, Europe. And so they do. And it's kind of just an oddity, just a, a quirky, cool little find. Uh, Europe seemed to be more obsessed going into like 1650s to 1750s, about a 100-year stretch there. They were really into plants, so house plants, tulips. The Dutch had their famous uh, tulip collapse where the they speculated on tulip bulbs for like the equivalent of a couple million dollars a bulb. And uh, then it all crashed on them. It was the first real economic bubble that we have documented, and you can watch it unfold through the commentary, and it happens very quickly. Uh, but a lot of places, so Amsterdam and then like in Germany, a lot of people have ponds on their property. And so people take these goldfish and they kind of just throw them in their ponds, really rich people. And uh, they're not really trying to breed them very well or anything in Europe for a while. So things start to change in the late 1700s. Also, there's a lot of like wars. Like there's the Franco-Prussian War and the austro hungarian I mean, there's just war after war after war up to the 20th century. Some of them worse than others. But it just... I think the problem is not that people weren't doing things, and I'd love to see... That's where I'm asking for you guys, if you happen to know, if you have any source material that I could look at. I'd love to put together a video with photos or illustrations, paintings, uh, excerpts of what was going on. It's just because a lot of times historians don't care about goldfish, and they're talking about war or... If the church was in danger, they're talking about how great the church is or how bad the church is, and you you know. So there's, I suppose, bigger fish to fry than fish keeping. So maybe that's why we don't hear about it as much. But come back to the 1700s and late 1700s, even over in America, uh, fish keeping becomes a hobby of... The rich, but also of, like, kids. Like, kids would catch local fish and things, and they would put them in uh, little ceramic, uh, I guess, wash basin type things. And they'd throw a lily pad in there, and they'd, you know, change the water out. There's a guide for, uh, it's called, like, a boy's guide to 
uh, growing up, I believe, and it had it was an old book I had that was from 1820 originally, and uh, it had like ways to catch fish, snare fish. So keeping like uh, you know rainbow uh, flashing like uh, what are they called the the local fish. Um, sorry guys, I'm having a, a brain hiccup. But like the the darters and all the the local um, sunfish and little bass and perch and stuff like that, uh, encouraging kids to do that. And they did that shiners, rainbow shiners. Thank you so much. Uh, there's some really pretty local fish that don't need to be heated. But by 1850, there's people in both Berlin, Paris, and then uh, soon after London who start saying, you know what, let's start bringing back some of these exotic fish that came from our our imperialism from our colonies and things and they they basically in in these territories so for instance hong kong was a british place uh you know there's other places in indonesia that were dutch there's uh french in vietnam and the people that were stationed there undoubtedly these naturalists upper class uh dignitaries Uh, A lot of which times may have been bored in between tasks. Uh, You know, it takes months to get word back to home. And they're basically like little dictators and get to do whatever they want to some extent. I mean, depending on the place and the country. But uh, they end up with time to kill and lots of resources. And so certain things like uh, Chinese fighting fish, as they're commonly called, but uh, paradise fish become a common thing in the Chinese territories. Uh, The Thai uh, fighting fish also, uh, which are bettas. And so those sort of fish are being kept on location in the tropics by Europeans. And just uh, locally, they're kept as good good luck. So like in India and in... in, uh, Japan, China, Vietnam, a lot of places kept little fish out of the rice paddies and they would put them in the water bowls. They decorate the front of their house or their courtyard or or their open air kitchens and things in the warmer places. They'd have these big water bowls, especially in China, you can see it uh if you if you've seen the giant uh they like well, here's a good example. This is a knockoff of one. But these big old jugs and vases and ceramic bowls, the wider ones were more common. So that kind of thing. And they would keep their fish in there, and they would basically help keep the mosquito population down, as well as uh, the bigger fish, the carp and things. We're still in the poor families still kept as a food source on hand, but as agriculture took over and cities grew more and more in Asia, you started to see uh, the the rice paddies were a source of also these lower paid workers and peasants getting stuff out of the rice paddies and selling it to Europeans, and that included fighting fish um, in other parts of colonialized, uh, you know, down in South America and stuff. Uh, out of Colombia, some of the colder water, but still tropical species. So like salt and pepper corridoras by 1850 are another fish that's brought to Europe. So it's really, there's a, a goldfish craze that happens in the 1700s and early 1800s in Paris and uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, a little bit in London, but in Germany, Paris, the Netherlands, Belgium uh, particularly, and the Czech Republic. They go a little bit goldfish crazy again, and they make the big fancy tail goldfish and the googly-eyed goldfish and, you know, just all the goldfish you can think of. Well, not all of them, but a lot of the different variations that you think of traditionally as f- fancy goldfish start appearing. Uh, the work of... Linnaeus as well as, well, I suppose Darwin discussing things also, but 
during his lifetime that he wasn't, you know, the most like celebrated guy. There were five or six people all working on the same idea. And, uh, the, uh, Mendel is the other, uh, gentleman that it was Gregory Mendel, who was a monk, uh, in Europe. And he actually first figured out the genetics of, doing things intentionally. So, of course, people knew how to breed for traits they liked. So a horse, you know, ran faster. <clears throat> so you breed it with another fast horse. But over time, uh, you have to learn a little bit deeper than that. So you start breeding generations earlier to cross and learn dominance. And so first place he learns that is with pea plants, Later on, uh, the color of their of their flowers, he realizes, can skip generations. And so he starts figuring out the probability for each generation to have what color flower, depending on what mixes. And he set up uh, something you've probably done in high school or elementary school called a Punnett square. And that's where you do big R, little r, big L, little l, or whatever you want to call the trait. And then you mix them. Uh, on a matrix chart. So he figured that out, and people immediately began to apply it to goldfish and things like that. Tetra Keeper, hello. Welcome. So he applies, or people apply this to goldfish, to, to the fighting fish. Also, a culture of fighting the fighting fish begins to pop up a little bit in uh, sailors' ports and things like that. Uh, bored sailors, I suppose, bet on anything and everything, and fish were uh, right there with them. So you soon after this period, you start to see by 1860 or so, you see the first tropical fish attempts to bring to bring them living back to Europe, and the idea of heated tanks is kind of. Per perfected, or not perfected, but uh, well-established, and people like uh, Pierre Carbonier, uh, he, Carbonier, sorry, it's, it looks like the word carbon, and then another N, and then I-E-E-R-R, -R. so a French fellow named uh, Pierre Carbonier, Carbonier uh, was the first to breed uh, these tropical fish. He bred kissing fish. He bred paradise fish, uh, you know, also known as Chinese fighting fish. He bred some of the gouramis. He also bred corridoras in the early 1870s in France. And in 1860, well, 55 was the first expo. He actually had, um, he actually had some really cool, uh, fish that he was keeping in subtropical fish as well as the goldfish in a bunch of varieties and uh americans in paris also saw this and took it back then london got competitive with um with uh with france in general you know they'd had wars ongoing and essentially they London had its own uh, budding movement, but Paris was really where it was at. Paris and Berlin were where all the new innovations came in, such as heating a room or actually wood fire or uh, gas lamp, oil lamp, heating uh, tubes that went into a fish tank, and then also learning that you need a fountain in the tank, which basically was just an air stone. They didn't know why exactly. They thought churning water was the key. Also during this time, and even before it, the other big thing was snails. So people, elite women uh, in society, oftentimes in, in Paris and in uh, you know Brussels, in uh, Amsterdam, Prague, they start keeping pet terrestrial and aquatic snails uh and there were actually snail dealers in paris that had like a not a union but like a guild and they had basically they'd wear like a trench coat and they'd have wet handkerchiefs wrapping up these snails 
like murite snails and things, and they would sell those, and then people would put them in a little bowl of water in the summer and keep them, and then inevitably when they died, uh, they would take the shell, like something like this, this is a South American uh, snail from Machu Picchu, they would uh, take those and wear them as necklaces and jewelry, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's also going on. Uh, there's a woman that I talk about in depth in a video, and uh, I'm, I'm still working on. I have several more videos, but actually women, uh, even in a time when it was hard for women to stand up and start you know, a movement or a business and whatnot on their own without their husband's help, there are some really amazing stories of women really pushing the aquatic hobby forward, more so than men even, uh, e even with the power differential being awful. So I suggest you go check out some of those stories, especially out of France. The Fr French Re Revolution, who would have thought it had anything to do with fish keeping, but it did trickle down, meaning that women were free to uh, basically buy and sell things, and uh, the snail keeping, as I mentioned, uh, was a, f a fad amongst predominantly women. And then it became speculative, and men and women were buying just to resell, and people were getting odd snails from Africa and from all over the place, and... Uh, they started building terrariums for them. Another huge trade in the pet store type field is songbirds. So all the way to medieval times, you could get swallows or sparrows, canaries, things like that. You could buy and you could buy the cages at even early department stores, Sears and uh, Harold's and things like that. Uh, Harrods. I mean, so you could get, these harder to find creatures uh, by the late 1790s or into 1800, you could get uh, budgies or parakeets as we call them usually, uh, as well as cockatoos and things like that, cockatiels. And people were keeping those. And so these stores pop up rather than just specific traders or a guy who was on a ship and they decided to throw five monkeys and a barrel of Chinese fighting fish in there and see what made it back. You started to get these specialists and these breeders, and they began to actually set up shop. By the 1920s and 1910s, you actually have pet shops in most of the port cities. And by the 19, late 1920s and 30s, as the automobile becomes popular, you, in, in all Western uh, cities, you start to see that there are pet stores, as we would think of them, popping up all over. So what I need you guys to do, if you can help at all, or if you know anything, if you have a grandfather, or your father, or you, or whoever, and you remember your pet store from the 1960s, or 50s, or whatever, your local fish store, um, maybe there's a magazine that you bought way back then that was talking about history. It's just, I can't find a lot of good source material. Definitely not in one place. I'm just showing snow for those who are curious. I wiped off my railing again, and it looks like it's coming back, but it's a lot wetter right now. The street's doing uh, pretty good. They de-iced it. They scraped it. Like, it's it's uh, not really an issue uh, out here anymore. But uh, if you look over here, uh, let me show you over in our kitchen. The snow from the last, like last night and the day before, we still have spots where there's a, a, a good chunk of it. So basically, um, I wanted to just kind of recap all of that stuff for you guys about the history of how we got to modern pet keeping but what i want to know from from folks viewing is if do you remember your grandfather or do you remember you know stories of how they kept what animals turns out angelfish were being kept by 1890 people were breeding some of them 
uh, the Leopoldis, the Ultimas, and, or the Ultim, uh, the uh, several other species of cichlids were being kept. So some of the more hardy uh, fish were being kept frequently by these naturalists and enthusiasts in later clubs. And then, so for instance, Chicago, which is very inland, and the railroad and cars made it possible, you, you get uh, aquarium societies. So instead of a club like this one, or I mean like locally, like we have a club of people who have them at home, you would get these clubs where they would spend the money to get custom things. So unless they were a very rich, like Vanderbilt or landowner or something, uh, you would you know, railroad tycoons and so forth, steel mag magnets, magnets, magnets. I don't know. Rich people. <laughs> uh, they would start uh, keeping these things on their own. People who would have private zoos and just bring stuff over. But the animals were seen as a commodity by a lot of, especially the rich people. I'm not saying that they didn't love their animals. I, I'm sure there's exceptions. But a lot of it was just an opulent display of wealth. Like, look what I can keep alive in my backyard. Uh, top that kind of thing. And so you see lions and tigers and bears and tropical fish and, oh my, you know, all sorts of stuff. And because of that, it really allowed a lot of people who did love these fish and wanted to study them for the sake of science to have jobs to keep them alive. And so some of our best... Uh, scientific information and everything comes from these people who were tasked with taking care of rich people's menageries of animals. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Industrial Revolution allows for a middle class in America. Uh, goldfish by the 1850s are here. Uh, by the 1880s, 1890s, uh, there are goldfish farms in Indiana, in Long Beach, and several other places around uh, America, which is pretty cool, I think. Interesting. Hold on one sec. Let me just turn this guy on. So, <clears throat> let's turn this around. Another tank. So, I'm going to finish up talking here. But, yeah, what I was asking is, I know uh, that sources are a little limited on some of the info that you can get. But I would really love to hear if you guys know more about fish keeping. It's really the 1890 to 1940 or so that I'm curious about. Because after World War II, we also had a ton of people bringing back uh, fish from you know places like Hawaii or uh, the Philippines, Indonesia places where they'd been stationed or traveled through on their way to war, uh, of course you've got people who are in the Audubon Society and like birds and like fish and like, you know, it's just different thing things all over the place when you get half a million troops, young men, uh, moving all over the place, you end up with some interested in just about everything and a lot of them would, you know, pocket things and bring them back. Um, so I would just love to find some more imagery to put with these stories. And if anybody has that or finds an archive of good information, that is what I would love to see. You know, most recently you start to see, in the 1960s really, you start seeing the, the large chain of um, pet stores. Before that, it was more, you know, Sears department store would sell, uh, or J.C. Penney's, like mail order catalogs and things. Even in like pioneer frontier days in North America, uh, you would see for your covered wagon when you stock up, you could get a cage for songbirds or um, a fish weir or trap uh, weaved or uh, a holding container for fish like a, a tarp, basically a waterproof cat gut and oil lined uh, cloth that you could set inside a wooden box and keep fish in. Um, so there's interesting stuff like that out there and I'm just looking to figure it out where, where it lurks. Mm. Later on, uh, you know, grangers and 
things like that would start to bring some of these pets out of just the urban cities with docks and things uh, and you'd start to get uh, into the interior and the heartland of America as I said post World War II the car everyone has the middle class is growing uh, in white America anyhow and uh, black America too I suppose uh, but really uh, you start to see that uh, Mickey Mouse Disneyland and not, I'm not saying that facetiously uh, and this is facetiously Happy Days, uh, you know, American graffiti style, 1950s cruising culture, rock and roll. Um, you've got kids who love animals, usually, you know, most kids seem to enjoy animals. And people start really commodifying fish along with monkeys and all sorts of other stuff. And so you started either just getting really flashy fish or fish that were kind of brutal, like piranhas and uh, sharks and catfish and things like that that would put on a show for guests. Uh, after that, the hobby really opens up, like I said, after World War II. Uh, there's some people breeding in the 1930s, uh, South American species in North America, uh, they, there's new technology in the aquarium. They're starting to understand how, uh, you know, maybe it's bacteria or some, like, a lot of times they don't say bacteria directly, but they'll say, uh, you know, moving water and then the, the soil at the bottom needs to be uh, aged for its, you know, magic to come out or whatever. You know, they didn't say magic, but they said... You know, for its ethereal properties to manifest, it must sit underwater for at least three months or, you know, different instructions like that. So they start to figure out that stuff. And then later on, we get into pH and TDS and all of that. And then coming up into modern times, we have basically trying to figure out how to breed all these things. And in the 1960s, People get pretty gung-ho about it, and we start bringing in all these fish from South America and Africa and Southeast Asia and breeding them specifically in Florida. And big companies like Seagrass that are trans shippers and importers and distributors, like whole, the wholesalers wholesaler, uh, start to pop up, five, 5D Imperial, um, later on the... Uh, cichlid connection and the wet spot places like that in modern times uh, modern the last 20 30 years uh, so I just thought that this was kind of an interesting story I wanted you guys to give me your input in the comments after this please give this video a like if you like it oh my hair is insane and uh, this is kind of a precursor video to what I would like to make a polished version of more concise and so forth so i hope you guys have enjoyed this little story time this chat uh if you guys find this interesting please share it with friends uh the channel has been a little slow just because of the snow and i've been tired and not feeling so hot physically but um hoping to get it back on track and specifically talking more about history and things hence the uh I should have just cut straight to the point, but talking about the goldfish in World War One and uh, odd little facts and quirky stories like that are coming soon, I believe. Uh, some of my books from the late 60s advertise the Tropical Fish Hobbyist Magazine, if you could even find copies. Yeah, like Axelrod and stuff. I would love to get a hold of some of that stuff. I've got some stacks here of magazine well I don't know. I've got a big mess is what I've got but stacks of uh, material there and then online you know Google Books and things like that sometimes Amazonas will have an interesting article on like an 80 or 90 year old guy or gal who has been keeping angelfish for instance and feeding them hamburger meat and keeping them in a slate bottom tank with a, a terracotta construction cone looking thing or discus or something like that uh but uh that's where you guys come in if you guys want to see this stuff let me know if you'd like uh 
I, my existing series you can go check out. Just go look through my older videos. It's probably almost a year old now. And uh, other than that, uh, yeah, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Stay warm if it's cold where you are. Stay cool if it's too hot where you are. And uh, I guess I'll see everybody a little bit later. Do we have any last minute questions that I can answer before I bounce like a kangaroo out of here? Um, since I feel like I kind of skipped over questions in the interest of talking. <clears throat> so the Grammys were also one of the earlier fish. And Betas, well, you probably won't see these ones. They're just chilling in the dark. These are siblings, but they're getting old enough to the point where now they're nipping at each other. So, uh, you know what surprised me was that within 10 years, uh, there were Betas of Fantail and, like, Half Moon and stuff like that. Like, it happened very quickly, the finnage arrangements. And same with guppies, which doesn't surprise me because they're breeding and and uh, generational turnover rate is so incredibly fast. But yeah. Uh, also, thank you again for that super chat. That was great. Justin Padilla, welcome, New England Endler. Yes, I agree. There, yeah. Old fish books and magazines at yard sales and uh, swap meets and things like that. Yeah, totally. Uh, and that's kind of what I've been keeping my eye out for and what this stack is. And kind of this old book, which is actually Axelrod, who did the Tropical Fish magazines. He's got like a billion animals named after him. Uh, and he's kind of a shady character. I, I should do an episode on him, uh, some of the weird things he did. Also, another interesting tidbit about the history of these fish is that uh, P.T. Barnum claims that he brought over, or he claimed he's long dead now, but he was a great showman, the greatest showman, as they said, uh, and he, he claimed that he brought the goldfish over and he would sell them at his shows and he'd get them to jump through little hoops in the water, swim through little hoops, uh, things like that, throw it, the penny toss thing where you throw whatever, back then it was probably the equivalent of 20 bucks and you could get a goldfish or whatever. Um, so, interesting claims made by a lot of people. Uh, Pliny the Elder as well as uh, Cicero, a, a lot of people in Roman and, and texts have claimed this or that from... Uh, history, but if you know anything about history, I, I myself was a history and anthropology major, but you know that they're like known like as the great history historians and chroniclers, and they're also known as the great liars because they screw it all up. But I mean, do you can you blame them? Like, what were they working with as source material? You know. And then the other thing is they told these stories. Uh, in their books, not as just a book to write down, since most people couldn't read or write, but they would travel around and they'd tell it, so they'd have to spice up their stories or put a story to the timeline uh, instead of making it a boring, like, you know, uh, no offense to the Bible, but like when you you read Genesis and you're like, and then Jedediah begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so who was the son of the blah 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 and the nephew of blah blah you know it just goes on and on uh it can get tedious so i see why they ended up doing uh that oh wow so ginger graves my fish you gave me advice on saving did survive and is back in the 40 gallon his surviving pals not sure what happened in the tank well i am so glad to hear that ginger uh that Seriously, that is like, that's what makes me happy to be doing this channel and why I want to keep doing it, why I want to grow it. I love that, you know, a lot of people have been saying, dude, why don't you have more clicks or why don't you promote your channel more and things like that. But I love you guys. The people that have been drawn to this channel are very heartfelt, uh, kind to each other, sharing information on Facebook with each other, helping each other problem solve and just you know cool community has arisen in this in this uh 
crowd also with a long attention span and i think that's pretty special in the youtube realm a lot of people just blow through videos and uh, you guys as my viewers tend to stick it out for you know at least 10 minutes which is quite the feat when you find out that a lot of videos have like a 30 second retention on average I think two minutes is the retention for like YouTube at large. Also, real quick before I go, you can see that my RU2s are growing up. Not a single female. I got nine males out of the last batch and no females. Also, my May Tangensis, those little fry up there, all May Tangensis, which look like that guy who just came right near the screen. And this one who's coming near the screen again. They're blue and bronze and striped. Uh, those guys right there and peach colored I think they're really beautiful but they're just hard to show on screen uh, I'm glad that you like the history lessons ginger I mean that's that was the idea the secret history living in your aquarium uh, was the idea for the channel so all right you guys I'm gonna get out of here I'm actually gonna take a nap because uh, you, ever since the lightning thing, I, I just I, the stamina is just not good. So uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Take care of your critters. I will be making videos about these topics. Maybe I'll break it down more specifically. I do have a video called Slang and Snails, like it's 1865 or something like that, about the like black market snail slanging business people in trench coats with their wet trench coat handing snails off to people and being like check this one out it's got tiger stripes on it but don't tell anyone because it's they caused salmonella frequently and not that they knew about germ theory and stuff like we do now but they did know that like you shouldn't eat raw shellfish and stuff like that and so a lot of times the snails got a bad rap because little kids would put them in their mouth and choke on them and all that kind of stuff too so don't do that if you're out slanging snails. But uh, take it easy, guys. Uh, if you find any information visually, please let me know. I would love to read it or see it or include it into something that's a little more approachable than just me chatting and wandering around my own tanks. And I will talk to you guys later, so take care.